our election laws are really far behind what they should be in modern day to make it easy for people to vote. We're talking about getting people out to vote. Mm -hmm. People I talk to don't have nobody to vote for. People with disabilities who have to face the barriers, who are not any more motivated, the people without disabilities are. Voting is not political. Um, pushing a candidate is political. for the 2014 midterm election. Because we, we've got pride in New York, right? Ready, let's go. 47th place. And that's particularly surprising because when you look at the education factors, uh, we rank fifth in terms of percentage of population that has a graduate degree. And we rank ninth for uh, people with just a regular college degree. So, we're educated. Four years ago, the turnout was 229,387. That was four years ago. And last year, in a non-governatorial year, it was 200,024,794 uh, versus that 229,000 that uh, turned out in uh, 2014. In Westchester County, the, the one statistic I have seen was that there was a pretty strong turnout for president election in 2016. It was like 65% turned out. But more consistently, I think that we rank in 30%. Somewhere in the 30s is the turnout. And if it's some of the local elections, it's going to be less than 30%. So you're dating four out of ten people telling you what to do with your life. Uh, there's also a, a statistical reality that voter participation at the local level tends to correlate with property ownership. Uh, when you feel more rooted in a community, when you're paying a property tax bill directly, uh, you may feel as though um, uh, you have an enhanced interest in the choices made by a local government. Uh, whereas when you're renting, uh, perhaps uh, you may be a more uh, transient, not quite as rooted, uh, the payments you make are not as direct. Uh, now, I think that's a mistake because I think people who rent have a, a powerful and a wide-ranging interest in the nature of the community. So I, I certainly hope that people, whatever their housing situation, would choose to vote. Uh, but again, it is a reality that um, uh, home ownership is a strong predictor of whether people will turn out. Four years ago, we had a request to some 11,703 uh, absentee ballot. These applications were put in some 11,703 absentee ballots. This year, in a gubernatorial race, we have some 20,465 requests put in. Last year, we had a request of 8,800 absentee ballots. So as you can see, there's a lot of interest this year in this election. A candidate may not check every single one of your boxes, but if they check the ones that are most important to you, then that's probably who you should go with. If your standard is going to be, I need to find exactly the perfect person or I'm going to excuse myself from this process and not participate at all, then I think you're doing a democracy and you're doing our neighbors a great disservice. We have a responsibility to choose among the practical choices that are available to us and uh, to choose the person who, by virtue of their, their values and goals and experiences and skills, is best able to move the ball forward, however we define that as individuals. Um, so I think saying, well, I, I don't particularly care for either of them, or this one I disagree with on that, that's a cop-out. Uh, look at your choices and decide which one is better and which one is worse, and, uh, and then cast a ballot on that basis. I say there's always someone, and that when you say that represents me, maybe we ought to step aside and say represents our community. We have to be more community-minded, and they may not be the ideal candidate for you, per se, but they certainly can articulate a platform that generalizes a need that's in the community. Well, there are, there, there are different ways to vote, believe it or not. Uh, if you don't like any of the candidates, you can do what's called a bullet hole vote. Go in and don't pull any lever or don't vote. 
but register your vote so when it comes out, uh, it'll say if you know there's 10 people voting and there's only nine votes registered for both candidates, it shows that there's dissatisfaction. It's very hard sometimes, even though our polls are open for, you know, from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., to really make a point of taking that time and getting to the polls and voting, I think for a lot of people sometimes seems like just one more task that they have to cram in to a given day. So for example, if you have to get to work by 10 a.m. and you live an hour and a half away from work and Cuomo's MTA is in full effect, that might stop you from being able to go to the polls in the morning to vote. Why can't they mail in their ballots? Why can't they vote in advance? Why can't we let them do it on the internet? These are all things we can do. So we gotta find ways to make it easier for people like my dad and me last week to vote. Well, early voting would help because now you have more time to sort of prepare people um, in, a, in a way that is not under duress, is not under stress. Um, early voting will certainly um, help. It's question is sometimes even something you know, that you make factors that may not be fully considered, a person may need an aid to go to vote, or a friend or a family member. They just can't get up and go to the polling place. They're not driving. They need assistance. They have more options. They can do it, especially if they also work or go to school. When you see legislatures pass laws limiting access to the polls, the only reason that can be is because incumbents don't want more people to vote. Because if you're an incumbent and a bad one, low turnout helps you. That's right. We had record turnout this past year, and that's why you had so many incumbents go out. 32 states have got early in-person voting. New York State doesn't. Often, a lot of communities have had to fight for that vote. And what happened after 2013? What did we start to see on election day? ID laws? What? Voter suppression. And here it's not so much a matter of uh, suppressing vote as it is failing to take advantage of things like early voting, voting by mail, that might make uh, voting more inclusive for a wider range of our, uh, of our communities. 27 states allow absentee voting. In New York State, you have to certify that you're going to be out of, away from your district and you cannot literally get to the poll to vote that day. The criteria is that you're not able to be at the poll on election day. You're stating you're, you know, that you're out of town, you're out of the county, um, you're out of the country. That's the criteria. And it's gotten a lot easier to form, to fill out. The polls are open from 9, I mean from 6 a.m. until 9 uh, p.m. And so if you're unable to be there from 6 until 9, then you make a request for an absentee ballot. And incidentally, the Board of Elections sends two employees to the nursing homes. So we do make it very convenient to vote. And if you are on permanent uh, disability, um, we mail you send in a form stating that you're on permanent disability and your ballot go directly to your house automatically every election. Well, first of all, everybody doesn't have access to online. There's this huge assumption that you can just go online and get what you need. And there's a whole segment of the population that does not have access. So if you have access, perhaps you can find that form and fill it out. It is, it is not a tough form. It, it is fairly readable if you have a certain level of education. So when I talk about the elderly and an absentee ballot, no, they can't access it that way and they can't fill it out without assistance. They're told, oh, don't worry about it, you can use an absentee ballot. Or even when they get to the voting place, they're told, oh, the machine is broken. Don't worry about it. There's the affidavit ballot, I think it's called, that they can use instead of actually using the machine like everybody else. So now the person, again, I'm using, because it's my disability, who is blind, now has to have a Republican and a Democrat come over and read 
the ballad to them. And not only read it, read it as if it's theater in front of everybody. And this year is not a presidential. It is a gubernatorial. It's not the county executive. It is, however, election of all of the New York State Assembly seats and the New York State Senate seats. And those are the people who can change the election law. So I, you know, I really hope that people will bear that in mind when they think, well, maybe this isn't such an important election. It really is. Your state representatives are very, very important to, uh, to our life here in New York. To strengthen the requirements about teaching civics and citizenship in school. So I don't know, I'd be interested in how many of you actually learn anything about civics after about second grade. Yes. So I'm taking comparative government. It's the first time I'm learning about, like, in a school setting about anything of government function. My school is very small, and they're deathly afraid of being political, and registering for voting is apparently a political thing now, and not more of a civic duty. I did AP Grub, and I like, have a really good teacher, and um, I started like the civics club at my school. We had to go through so many hurdles to actually even start it. We're afraid. Very afraid of like starting anything <laughs> semi-political. Liberal stuff is like, like too controversial. Liberal. Yeah. yeah. So he actually actually just passed out the forms, and our whole class just sat for a couple of minutes, and just everyone registered to vote in class. It took uh, not even half a class period. So, I mean, that's just one teacher in one yeah, school who clearly is interested in something. I found that at my school, the teachers were you know perfectly willing and happy to register their students, but they didn't know or thought it would be a hassle to get the voter registration forms. Um, so I, I think digital registration would really help with that. I live near Shell. It's more likely for me to walk down the street and see the mayor and Blanks and pushing around the car in the shop right. So I think that they should kind of focus on that, the focus on like the um, state, and state local. local area and then how you can actually um, become, you know, involved. Voting is not political. Um, pushing a candidate is political. Uh, all schools should encourage those, which is something we do also. Uh, when you are voting age, to register to vote. Those who feel that civic education is an important part of a well-rounded education as a whole uh, should certainly express that view to superintendents and members of boards of education and state commissioners of education uh, so that those who are in a position to uh, introduce um, more civic instruction uh, can, can act on that principle. I don't think people like to cast votes unless they feel that they're educated on the issues. And in, the, you know, in our area, most people read the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times um, every day, but they may not necessarily read a local paper that's telling them what's happening on the local level. What we are trying to do is educate we have many, many forums. We call them civic engagement forums. We had, they were called Rev Up the Vote workshops. And Rev the Vote is actually nationwide, but this is the first time it was done in Westchester County. I'd like to welcome all of you to part one of the Voting uh, Empowerment Workshop. So thank you all for coming up. And we participate with other organizations like the League of Women's Voters. The same group of activists who had been working and campaigning and had learned all kinds of organizational skills trying to win the vote for women. As that happened said, well now we have the vote, what can we do to help women make the choice that they want to make and make an education choice. So the league started immediately thereafter. It's been around for a hundred years. And our first priority was to educate voters. And initially it was women voters, but now it's all voters. We have a printed guide. We publish 40,000 of them every year. And you'll find them in, in, in any of your local libraries. You'll find them in community areas. The world is changing. So now we also have what we call Vote 411, which is an online program, uh, very, very easy to use. You go to vote411.org, you enter your address, and it will tell you what your ballot's going to look like, 
who the candidates are, who the races are. So that's, voters' education is really, really our mainstay. Say all politics, to quote Tip O'Neill, is local, local. So I mean, the, 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 the structure of your local government in terms of your um, quality of life is more than the uh, county and state government. I mean, the county, don't, the, the county don't come around and pick up your garbage, and the state don't come around and pick up your garbage. At the local level, where you're not talking about millions of ballots cast, but rather hundreds or thousands, uh, you're hyper aware of the fact that, uh, that every person can, can shape the outcome. So I won my very first election for city council by, I think, around 100 votes. Some states are considered all Republican, all Democrat, uh, and they don't vote because they don't think their vote counts. But I can tell you on a personal level, the first time I ran, uh, I won, they called, joked around, it was a landslide. I think I won by 23 votes. On election night, I literally was up one vote. So if that doesn't tell you that each and every vote counts locally, I don't know what does. Voting is your empowerment. Voting is how we reach others and let them know how things should be. This is not exclusive to any one state, any one county. This is a national issue. And so for me, like, I'm never willing to give up my freedom, and that's why I vote. We want to be part of the solution. We have to participate. And there is no more powerful way that speaks to that power and that responsibility than at the voting booth. The vast majority of the voters and the people in this country are dissatisfied with their elected officials. And the only way you're gonna change it is, quote, the power of the people. And the people are responsible to go vote. It's hard to be a squeaky wheel when you have to pay rent, you gotta pay mortgage, you got kids, you got a job, you're tired, but it's the only way we're gonna get anything done. When I talk about voting, I can't talk about it in an isolated fashion. I have to help people see that voting has been the foundation of change. Vote as if your life depends on it, because it does. This is a long-term fight and that every single conversation is part of the work. So even if someone's at church and they decide to ask their neighbor, did you go out and vote? That's civic engagement. Best way to get somebody, more people to vote, is for you to pers a person to, to just reach out to the neighbors and say, hey, did you vote today? Hey, can I help you vote today? Not, I think you should vote for so-and-so, but, but did you vote today? And so this is why we're all here tonight, to figure out together how to engage more citizens how to encourage more people to make it to the voting booth, not just to register, but to get there. And we're not just talking about this November, we're talking about making it back there again and again and again. We like to say that voting isn't a privilege, it's a duty.